Welcome to PA History To Go, a series of videos presented by the Pennsylvania Historical Museum Commission with funding from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. These short videos, filmed at locations along the Pennsylvania Trails of History, serve to introduce virtual visitors to our sites as we explore the varied stories that make up Pennsylvania's rich history. Watch them all to learn about the people, places, industries, and events that make Pennsylvania so special. The lumber camp at the museum was recreated. There was never an actual lumber camp here. It was built as part of the museum in 1972. But it's representative of what a typical lumber camp in the Northwoods of Pennsylvania would have looked like around the turn of the 20th century. And these camps were communities in and of to themselves. These camps were located where the work was and the work of harvesting trees for timber and lumber was you know, in remote mountainous and uninhabited areas. So when a job began, the jobber or the camp foreman, he was the person that would typically contract with the timber owner to cut a specific region at a specific price over a set period of time. He would amass a crew of wood hicks or men willing to work in the woods and cut down trees. And the first thing they would do is establish a campsite. The lumber camp. The lumber camp was typically located in the valley bottom. They would often build a spur rail line into the camp that would serve to bring supplies into camp, the, the food that they were eating, the tools they were using, and also take out the trees that they were harvesting. The logs would be loaded onto rail cars and taken to the mill. Early camps were often built of log structures, like a log cabin would be. Later camps, uh, once there were more sawmills operating in uh, the region where the timber was being harvested, would be built of sawn lumber. Some of the buildings that you need in a lumber camp to meet your basic needs to be that community would be bunkhouse and mess hall. That would be really the heart of the camp. That's where the men lived in the bunkhouse. The bunks were typically upstairs in that structure, large wooden frame bunks that were built big enough to sleep two or three men per bunk. And the downstairs would be a mess hall. That's where you ate. The mess hall had long wooden tables with benches where everyone sat down and ate together. The kitchen was attached to the bunkhouse and mess hall, and that was the domain of the camp cook where you would most often find women. They were also often the highest paid employee in the camp. While Woodhick might have earned between $1.25 to $1.50 a day, cooks often earned twice that, three or even four dollars a day. The cook had also a much longer day, so the cook had to be awake earlier and the cook stayed awake later, and they also worked seven days a week. The camp cook had to work even on the men's day off, which was Sunday. Some of the other buildings in camp that were very necessary were a blacksmith shop and a saw filer shack. The blacksmith was in charge of making and repairing tools. You needed someone on site that could take care of those things, keep your tools in good working order, make things like chains or spikes or other things that you didn't have on hand. Also, uh, shooed the horses, so he served the role of a farrier. The saw filer was solely responsible for keeping the cross-cut saws in good working order. And the saw filer uh, would work every day to sharpen and set the saws. The other building we have in camp here that is typical of a Pennsylvania lumber camp is the stable. Horses were important because they transported the logs from where they were harvested on the mountainside down to the bottom of the valley where that spur rail line was located. The horses worked in teams. The camp employee that worked with the team of horses was called a teamster. This camp has a feature that not every lumber camp had, and that is our engine house and barnhart building. The barnhart's an interesting piece of equipment, so it's got a fixed boom that can hoist the logs. It rides on top of specially constructed log rail cars. The loader would start on the car next to the engine. It would winch back, load the car in front of it, winch back, load a car, winch back, load a car. When all the cars would load it, they would uncouple the last car with the loader on it, leave it at the site of the log dump, and then come back the next day and repeat the process all over again. The Barnhart loader was an incredible time-saving device. Before these loaders existed, most of the cars were loaded by hand and required a crew of about a dozen men. So that cycle of boom and bust in the lumber industry, ramping up, bringing in all these immigrants, people from other parts of the state and other parts of the country to do the work, harvest trees, work in mills, work in tanneries, and then when all that was gone, leaving them on their own, 
uh, caused a, you know, an economic depression and long-term economic consequences that the, the region where the museum is located is still dealing with to this day in a very real way.